uh, because this is pretty interesting as um, Kip's uh, introduction. Uh, Kip Pendleton and the Pendleton Company in particular is a high performance business builder with a CEO outlook and a coaching approach from field to boardroom. So really this is a company uh, that they believe that the top guy uh, is the one who's making the decisions and you know very well that on the farm you're the one. It all belongs to you and they're gonna try to help make that happen. Um, Kip was born on a farm. He's from Champaign County, so he's an Illinois native. Glad to have you there. His dad um, was in the family business. His dad was J.W. Pendleton, was the agronomist in the 1960s for basic production advancements in soybean and corn while at the U of I. Did he actually work in crop sciences at the yes. U of I? Yep. In extension. In extension. Excellent. The Pendleton Group helps leading ag companies and emerging ag tech companies develop winning growth strategies around precision agriculture. That's something you hear about all the time that you may not understand. Big data and decision agriculture. There's a word that you probably don't hear very often, but I bet you hear about more today. Pendleton, of course, the company is an expert in the convergence of precision tools, information capture, knowledge systems, and decision support tools that are impacting and potentially redefining agriculture. Uh, from my perspective, where I sit as a farm broadcaster, big data is a snowball that is rolling really fast. And if you don't get on board, you'll just be swallowed up one way or the other. So it's kind of time to understand what data is and how it works and how it comes off your farm. I think Kip Pendleton's going to help us do a little bit about that. Kip. They're all yours. Give him a nice warm welcome, please. Now, can you hear me okay? Is my mic on okay? I thought I would walk a little bit in case any of you are getting tired. I can come over and kind of nudge you and say, well, hey, pay attention. No, it's, uh, it's good to be home. Um, this is home for me. I was born uh, just east of Urbana, about out by Mayview. If you know where Mayview 150 is, there's a little cemetery there. Our farm was about a mile south of the Mayview Cemetery. So it's good to be, good to be back here. Um, I'm gonna talk for about 25 slides on changes that you can apply from a technology standpoint that'll increase your yield or increase your profit. Some of these things some of you are ready to do. Some of these are things that you can do. And for some of you in the group, you might not do them at all, but we'll talk about that. First of all, I, I talk about I work in the family business. Um, both my folks are from the farm. My dad was at the University of Illinois and then the University of Wisconsin and USDA and then did international work, was the uh, Director General of Erie in the Philippines and ECRASTAT in uh, Nigeria. So I kind of have grown up helping people improve yield. So let's talk today about improving it here. Um, these are a couple of slides from, it could have been the Illinois Soybean Association, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we kid dad when we see this picture on the, on the left with the hat on, we called him Indiana Jones, and of course being from the University of Illinois, he said, you can't call me Indiana Jones, you gotta call me Illinois Jones. Um, so some soybeans there. This is, uh, maybe many of you went to the agronomy days or still go to the agronomy days. The, the other picture that's up there right there is the horse's ass. Technology used to be the width of a horse's rear. And uh, we went to 30 inch rows because we didn't need the width of a horse's rear anymore. So my dad did a lot of things in, uh, in technology. I've, I've kind of always moved to that perspective too. So I'll talk a little bit about some technologies today. So first let's talk about some products and some evolution. I watched in the breakouts, you guys are an active group and, and you're able to answer questions really quickly. So here, here's a, a short four question quiz. So what's that? Etch-a-Sketch. Etch now been replaced by, what do all the kids have instead of an Etch-a-Sketch? An iPad. An iPad. What's that? Five spindle. I showed a group the other day of that. It was a little bit younger maybe than this group. They had no idea. They said, what is a 45? Anybody remember going to meetings when we used overheads or going to school when you used overheads? Used to be technology transfer. How about this? 
Palm Pilot, the original PDA. A lot of you, some of you maybe took those to the fields and made notes on them. All of this today is obsolete. It's gone, but in its day, it was cutting edge. Let's talk about some things over the course of today that are gonna be cutting edge for you. First of all, if you like to follow technology, go Google Ag Funder, all one word, newsletter. Every week you'll get a note about the latest and greatest technology that's just been funded. In the last three years, $11 billion has come in to fund new ag tech companies. $11 billion. In, uh, and, and by the way, these slides will all be posted on the website, I believe. So uh, you can take notes, but uh, you'll also be able to access these later. Last year alone, there was almost $5 billion put in, which was almost twice what had been put in the year before. Um, really fast rate. One of the things, I don't have a pointer, but if you look on the screen side, it's the kind of things that you should be interested in. It's food e-commerce, it's irrigation and water, it's robotics and drones. So that's innovation that will be coming soon to you in Illinois. Not sure if right offhand if there's any Illinois companies on here, but this is technology that will come to the great state of Illinois and the great agriculture of Illinois. So I mention this because this is kind of the preview of some things that are coming, but what you're doing today will prepare you to utilize these technologies. So Gartner uh, hype cycle, when you see 527 companies, you go, boy, they're not gonna all make it, and they won't. There's a, there's a phenomenon called the hype cycle. Precision ag, you know, for 20 years is gonna be the next great thing. And it's gotten better every year, but any new technology goes to this peak where it's gonna change the world. And then everybody goes, well, it doesn't work on my farm exactly the way it was advertised. So you kind of move down into a trough. And then really bright leaders like you all in the room figure out how to adapt it, how to put it into a system, and how to make it really work. And that's the slope of enlightenment. And then, and then it flattens out again. It works, and the next great technology comes in and we repeat the cycle. So I want you to think about that as we talk further about you and your systems on your farm. So first, uh, you know, my dad, my dad's still alive. He lives in Champaign, he's 94 years old. And his lifeline and the way we communicate, there's five kids in the family, the way we communicate with him is on his cell phone. Because I'm up in Minnesota and my other brothers and sisters. And so we talk every day. He lives in a retirement home in Savoy, Illinois, assisted living. And they have a big table like this. When I first, where he has breakfast. When I first started in agriculture, I would go to John to Shelbyville, Guy's Steakhouse. They had a great big table. And uh, I worked for Pioneer then, and everybody goes, you gotta go have breakfast at Guy's and sit at the liar's table. And I had no idea what the liar's table was, but I learned quickly. <laughs> and it was where farmers exchanged information. And you know, of course, the first guy who talked never had a chance, right? Um, but it was a great place for stories. Well, my dad still has one of those. And so I'm talking to my dad about uh, a company called Spensa Technologies. They're out of Purdue. Everything is delivered on an iPhone or an Android, if you have an Android. But it shows you the information for scouting, shows you everything. And so I'm showing these eight guys sitting around the table this information. And they, they were just, and half of them have farm ground in Illinois or involved in family farms or their grant, grounds being rented. And they said, how could we do that? I said, it's simple, it's just right on your phone. And they all got out their flip phones like my dad. You can't do that on a flip phone. So first thing I'd say is, if you still have a flip phone, you can do what my dad does, you can talk to people, but some of what we're gonna talk about from here forward, you can't participate in. Smartphones are really, John, we were just talking about this, it's the computer on your hip. We used to all wear vice grips on our hip, now we got com computers or smartphones on our hip. So your system starts with your phone. As you farm, I wanna talk about two groups. I think there's kinda of two farmers across the Corn Belt. 
there's maximizers. I want you to think about this. There's maximizers. You kind of have a standard farm plan, and you focus to get it done. How many of you in the room are maximizers, do you think? Okay. And the rest of you are this. Are the rest of you optimizers? In other words, you're putting a plan together for the land, and you're focusing on getting it right, and it's not one size fits all, it's many sizes fits the situation. As you look at challenges today from, uh, boy, how am I gonna get more spending less? You can't be a maximizer. You have to move to be an optimizer. So think about that as we move forward because some of the tools and systems we're gonna talk about are not necessarily focused on being a maximizer, because a maximizer is go as fast as you can doing a standard operating procedure across your land. An optimizer is being specific for that ground, and I, I, I'm from Champaign County, right? Ground isn't different there at all, right? Wrong. Every piece of ground has variability. Some has more, but every piece of ground can be applied as an optimizer. Again, either system works. Pick a system, execute the system, and work, but we're gonna mostly talk about optimizing now. So I'm gonna use a couple of terms here. They're uh, terms that aren't my terms. They're terms that were put together outside of agriculture, but the example was written on agriculture. This is written in the, a year ago in the Harvard Business Review, summer of 2014, on the evolution of systems, and they used ag. Dr. Porter wrote about systems of systems. And if I look around this room, and if you guys, I'm not, I'm not gonna necessarily maybe ask you to raise your hand, but maybe I will. So today, some of you have precision ag. You might have auto steering, you might have a special planter. You might have a yield monitor. Everybody, everybody kind of got those? In actuality, there's still about half the market that still doesn't have auto steering. Maybe not in Illinois, but 55% of the market in major surveys taken last spring had auto steering. Once you've had auto steering, John, you'll never go back, right? It's just amazing. And it allows you to do incredible things. It allows you to go to sub-inch farming to optimize. Now the rest of the system has to go with that, but probably about half of you in the room have some pieces, or you know about those pieces, but you're not expert in them. When you go to the field in six weeks, you're gonna be calling the helplines, saying, I know it does this, but I can't remember exactly how. Help me. Right? or your local dealer, your local precision ag expert. So about 50% of the population's kind of here. This is important if you have an optimizer strategy, so I want you to keep following. We're gonna talk about the other 50%. 20% are way out there. They've totally ma mastered precision ag. Their auto steering works with their precision planter, which works with their sprayer, which works with their it's a full system. And they're using data, like some of the vendors that are over here and, and uh, partners in this uh, conference, they're using data to get it right. There's a group in the middle, though, that's about 30%. They've fully adopted precision ag, and they're using thumb drives mostly to collect data. They have millions of data points but they haven't gone to that upper right-hand corner where they've really turned it into knowledge. So that's systems of systems. And now if you take systems of systems a little further, you think about how many of you have ever heard Danny Kleinfelter, Dr. Kleinfelter's from Texas A&M? Got a couple of uh, hands back there. Danny's great, right? If any of you have ever worked with Frito-Lay, Danny's a, a key guy there. And he's a, he's a pragmatic, ag economist, right? He just puts it at your level. They've got large family farms in, in their family. And Danny talks about agriculture. 20% of you are making a great profit. 50% of you probably are just breaking even. 
and 30% of you in a commodity type business are losing money. So Danny would talk about this as saying, how do you end up in the, one of the top two buckets? How do you optimize and how do you utilize your resources and how do you plan to deliver that? Lots of opportunity, but to improve yield and profit, technology has to break Danny Kleinfelter's truism. So let's talk about that a little bit. Systems of systems, let's begin to look forward now. Now if you're on the right hand side of that last slide where you're beginning to use data, you're somewhere on the continuum that's on the bottom. If you start in the lower left hand corner, a data point is a million pieces of data that you've got on your thumb drive, right? That's the start of this continuum. When you pull that thumb drive out <laughs> and take it back to the house, and upload it and join it with all your other fields or operations, you have a set of pooled information. For that pooled information on your farm, you can do a set of analytics. Now this is where it begins to get tough because you start saying, analytics, what analytics am I supposed to do? It's where you may want a good partner and we'll talk about that in a second. But analytics, the analytics, what they really do is, is spit out, just like Dr. Nofsinger was showing in graphs and plotted and the R2s, and it gives you knowledge. And that knowledge then you can take to your ag retailer and you can make action decisions. You could go to the field smarter in four weeks or six weeks, ready to go. So that's a continuum. And here's how the system evolves. So in Precision Ag, you've got machine control, which is basic. Soon to appear, or maybe appearing now, is machine to machine control. Your yield cart coming up to your combine to make sure they align and unload and work together to unload, that's machine to machine control. In a lot of Illinois, you're gonna to begin to see machine to machine control where one tractor's following another tractor. It's called swarm control. If you've ever seen those pictures in Brazil or Eastern Europe where there's a lot of tractors in the field all together, that's machine to machine control, it's called swarm. That'll begin to come here as it's, I don't wanna take 10 days to plant, could we get this planted in five days? Could we go faster? So machine to machine control is the first step. It's a step that I think most of you are comfortable with and it's a step that will move forward with autonomy as it moves forward in the next five years. The next thing's kind of a new buzzword, but you're gonna see it everywhere. It's the next big thing you'll do in Precision Ag. You'll hear it called IOT, or Internet of Things. And what it really is is a set of things that you control off that smartphone, and it's monitors. Chad showed you this morning that biodegradable monitor right next to the row. That's an Internet of Things field monitor or sensor. Shows you real-time fertility or real-time moisture or real-time pest pressures from that standpoint that then either you can act or maybe your retailer who's linked into this with you too just automatically dispatches someone to make an application or someone to do a, a pest uh, monitoring. Uh, or moving forward. The other piece of Internet of Things are what Chad showed you with UAVs. I'm not gonna talk about UAVs because I think Chad already probably did, but it's a key way you can monitor. If any of you have really high population corn, that's no fun to try to scout in, is it? <laughs> you just can't. UAVs being able to get up above it. Wayne, we were talking at lunch, that ability to only see your end rows, that's not enough. <laughs> That ability to get above the field is really good. I don't know where UAVs, flyover planes, and satellite imagery is gonna sort out, but I can tell you they're all gonna be much cheaper than what you've paid. There are new satellites out there now that put what they call doves out, or shoebox, they're about the size of a loaf of bread. And these satellite imagery have really strong cameras. They can push through. Planet Labs is one of the groups. 
um, but they can, they can very quickly scan the whole Earth every day. You know, satellites used to be, when they first came out, every two weeks you could get a picture of your farm. And it was about every week. The new satellites can shoot your farm every day. So, because they're shooting it every day, they can say, oops, something just changed in the northeast corner of that field. And you get an alert on that smartphone saying, hey, there's an issue. Or maybe what you do from a satellite standpoint is you have an agreement that if it changes at all, or changes more than 5%, send me an image. I'll buy that image. You don't have to any longer buy a full year of imagery. You can buy bits and pieces of imagery at cost-effective areas. So Internet of Things, so again, more data, more pieces that are going to come together to help you manage your fields. Then you're going to need with all this data, unless you're incredibly talented and you're a data scientist yourself, you're going to probably need a good partner. Several companies, some of them I'll talk about in a minute, but decision support systems. Your seed provider today, Climate, might do it with Monsanto. Um, Incirca might do it for you with Pioneer. Or there's a number of unique groups that are totally and only focused on decision support systems. And I'll talk to you about some of the things I like about, about them. Last, and, and one of our other um, exhibitors was here, there's going to be last this, because you're running big businesses, right? There's going to be ERP systems. An ERP system, Caterpillar runs ERP systems. Every single stock you own, they run ERP systems. They're enterprise resource planning. That's what ERP stands for. So it would send to you or to your team, John, here's your task today, or here's your list of tasks today. And then when you're done, you'd click that and say done, and the ERP would report that. Granular's here, granular's one, conservice is one. I also believe there's gonna, a number of them that are gonna be, kind of move to this. So what you see up here today is probably as many as 300 different companies. You don't need 300 different <laughs> vendors. But one of the things you're gonna need to do is choose. I'm gonna share something with you and I'll, I'll share it again a little bit later. But how many of you are concerned about your data? Okay. How do you store your data today? John, how do you store your data today? Thumb drive? Somebody else back there? How do you store yours? Okay. So, so how, many of you, how many of you own stock? Right? This was a board of directors meeting right now, our annual stockholders meeting. And you went in there and you asked the question, so this very valuable information that we have in our company on 10 years of information, how, how do you, board or CEO or management team, how are you taking care of this data? What is your data disaster plan? What is your data recovery plan? And the answer you guys gave me is, is, a, is a one that most data is stored today. Anybody ever met Steve Kubich from Prime Meridian? Steve's over in Missouri. Um, Steve's been doing this about 10 years. He's got a really good large farmer. 10 years of data. The information was locked in his shed, in a drawer, locked. Guess what happened? Fire burned down the shed. 10 years of data, good data, locked. So I want you to think about, as we start talking about teams of teams partners, where's your data? If it's in a cloud, like say Amazon or whatever, it's backed up in at least three different, if not five different, system recovery centers if one of those servers went down. So think about your data. Make sure you trust who you give it to. But think about your disaster recovery plan for some increasingly important resources for your farm. And as we talk forward, I think the value of your farm is going to be a lot connected to the data. 
if you do it right, and if you have unique data versus others, the value of your farm will be worth far more. Let's talk about something else. Really good systems like we just talked about. Anybody beginning to feel like this stuff's kind of complicated? I have no idea what he's talking about right now. So the comment I would say is think like this about who your team is that's working with you. This book's a great book. If you like um, or if you're amazed at the technology that the U.S. has applied over in the Middle East, read this book. Because it talks about the best of the best. Some of the co-authors are actually Navy SEALs, right? So they talk about how they had to change their plan to be able to meet the challenges of, of Al-Qaeda and now ISIS. Really bright Navy SEALs and somebody with a garage door opener or cell phone and a dirty bomb was taking people out. So they had to change. And you read this book and it's units of five or six, just like kind of that you're sitting at the tables here. And how they're able to adapt. Kind of sounds like when the planter breaks down in spring, right? You got to move some seed, you got to get somebody there, you got to get it fixed, you got to get going again. Teams of teams are really going to be ever important as you get more and more sophisticated with systems. So as you begin to make decisions, who's your supplier for decision support? Who's your precision ag specialist you work with? Who's going to support you to make sure you keep going? Because here's some of the things to consider. A lot of you in the room are probably what I'd call owner operators. You own your farm, you operate your equipment, you know exactly what's happening. And that's kind of how you've always done it. As this increases in complexity, the greatest value to you may not be sitting on the planter or in the combine. It may still instead be owners with operators. Having somebody running the planter and you're able to see it which you can do pretty easily with a lot of the technology now, remotely. Same with combines, same with sprayers. So you can have multiple things going on at, the, at once. That's a different skill set, leading and managing operators. The other area a lot of you may already do, right? Your manager's for, for owners. Illinois, I, last I saw, is about 55% of the ground is absentee kind of owned. It's farm managed. So you've already kind of been doing that. Think about if you could supply that information to your farm management or your, as a tenant, to the owner, landowner. Think about how you can differentiate yourself from the rest of the room. So if you're moving across this continuum, you're better able to do that. Some of you are going to say, look, I don't get this. And I don't think over the next 10 years I'm going to get this. So I want to get a really great trusted advisor. And I'm going to count on them to turn information over to me and really kind of hold my hand on Precision Ag, hold my hand on Decision Ag, and say, here's the recommendations, and then I'll go talk with my retailer. Or maybe my retailer's that person that's gonna do all that. But this trusted advisor, and remember that ag funder, the $5 billion? Robots and autonomy will happen in the next five years in agriculture. Now, will you have little robots that'll go down the, the field and it will stab a probe down through the root instead of a herbicide? Maybe, maybe not. But some of you in the room, the first one of those available, you'll have it. It'll be the next drone toy you got to have or you got to try. And it might be more cost effective than what you do today. So let's talk about some companies to be, be aware of. Some of them were here. Some of them you could talk to today or write them down and talk to them sometime this spring. But here's some companies that I really like and I'll talk about a number of companies here but companies you should think about and look at. So one is a group called Farmers Business Network. Anybody belong to Farmers Business Network in here? Okay. So Farmers Business Network is what you'd call a disruptive company. 
not to its members, but to industry. It, it talks to the industry and it disrupts a little bit like Uber and Lyft. Now, Uber and Lyft are taxi companies. Anybody ever taken an Uber or Lyft? Once you add that to your smartphone, you'll never ever take a taxi again. The Uber, you put it in, it shows up where it is, it tells you how many minutes it'll be there and you can watch on the screen and you can see the taxi come right to your front door or the, wherever you're at. Lyft does the same thing. I, I was just in Atlanta Sunday through Tuesday. Got an Uber from the airport into, into downtown Atlanta, $18. I took a regular taxi back because there was one when I walked out of the hotel, $32. I talked to the Uber driver he says he makes $41 an hour delighting people with his service. $41 an hour. Uber and Lyft are two companies that aren't yet setting their sights on ag, but could. Because in their real heart, they're logistics companies. If we're one big supply chain in agriculture, one of the logistics companies that is scaring the heck out of FedEx is Uber. The other one that's scaring the heck out of people is Lyft. General Motors just put $500 million into Lyft to just be able to access their software. That's pretty amazing. Logistics companies that might, might supply things to you or help you with your logistics Remember, if you switch to an owner-operator and you're, you're kind of moving things about, what you may be moving about, you might not own. You might move something else about. But what's amazing about FBN, it's about $500. What's amazing about Uber is it can be as half the cost of a taxi. They're really simple. They just go off that smartphone. You have a growing community and you talk to people who are in FBN, they love it and they'll tell you about it. Um, they, they create analytics, all the shared data. You put your data in and I put my data in and pretty soon you go, wow. Remember that analytics thing I mentioned? It's like, do you know how to do analytics? They are world class at doing analytics. They bring that forward. The analytics create what's called benchmarking. Here's the county average. Here's where you are, here's where somebody else is, or here's where you are in this field. The ability to bring that forward is what FBN can do. It's pretty neat. They are also beginning to source egg products and look at egg products. They're also beginning to make kind of markets for products with people, and they're beginning to look at handling those logistics. So FBN is one company. Will a company like Monsanto with climate allow them to ultimately win? I don't know or in Circa with the new Dow DuPont, whatever it'll be called. But it's neat companies. You benefit because this is stretching and a little bit out of the box, and you benefit because, man, this is pretty convenient. That cell phone I have now does a lot of things. Another company, it's here, the, some of the groups here. I know this company, I've known this company since about 2009. They are the biggest ag um, decision support company, I think, in the world. They started in Winnipeg, Canada. They expanded over to Russia and Eastern Europe. And now they're in Brazil and Australia, and they've just come to the United States. So if you looked at that earlier slide and you said, oh my God, I'm getting a headache. All those things Kip's talking about, I don't know, I, I can't begin to think about how to do all that. What's interesting about Farmer's Edge, they'll do all those things for you. They'll turn key with you. They're working with ag retailers to say, let us just put a program in for you. They'll handle your agronomy, your hardware, your software. Complete package. I don't know anybody else today that kind of offers that turnkey approach. And you know what? It's probably cheaper than you're maybe be paying an, another group today from the standpoint of what their services cost. So two different, one's very disruptive, 
The other is very partnering. Um, so definitely a company to talk to. Um, I think three people from Illinois are right here uh, with them from that standpoint. If, if this were agronomic and, and I was doing one of the breakouts, I would have talked about three things. I would fertilize my soybeans, which I heard in two of the breakouts. Um, I would probably change my plant population and I would look at multi-product things. Corn in these planters show a 15 bushel per acre advantage. Soybeans show a seven bushel per acre advantage in the work that Kinsey did with Vex Hybrid. So unique opportunity. Maybe economically you're not ready to buy a planter, but by all means watch this technology. I think it's one that will maybe be available from others, but it's, it fits the whole system of being an optimizer. The other group I'm gonna kind of flash through three slides. Most of what we do in ag is agronomically focused, right? We build crop plans or, you know, season agronomic plans. There's a group that was over here to, um, called Ag Solver. Ag Solver is a group out of Ames, Iowa, really bright group uh, that came out of the uh, Iowa State University. They focus on building an economic plan. We got any bankers in the room? Your banker will love these guys. Because they'll help you build an economic plan of, of not looking at what'll yield the most, but where should you invest to get the greatest return on investment across your field. So you start there and then you build an agronomic plan. The neat thing about Farmer's Edge and Ag Solver is they both have guarantees. If Farmer's Edge can't get you what you expect, they have a guarantee for you. They'll go through all that with you. Ag Solver, same thing. They have good, better, best kind of layers. The base, about thousand some dollars. If they don't find $5,000 in working capital for you, Savings, it's free. Now, I'm an ag econ major, but to me, even that makes sense, right? Um, so Ag Solver will take you through, it's, a, it's again, it's a cloud-based, takes you through information, gives you very specific information. It's like, how do I figure all that out? You don't, it's there in the program. Again, gives you multiple ways to look at your information. Again, focused economically uh, return on it. So let's talk about what's to come. And I'm about to wrap up, but evolution of what's happening now. Where's this all going? 525 companies don't need all those. 300 and some companies doing just precision ag and decision ag don't need all those. So what could be happening? Let me give you one example of John Deere. John Deere is you know, the best brand name known in the world in agriculture. John Deere's done a number of things just since last September. And by the way, John Deere is investing where the rest of their business is not growing. They're investing. It's what leaders do, they look for things to do. First thing they did last fall, September, they formed a JV, they didn't buy them, that's Deere's normal way. Instead, they formed a JV with a group, it's called Sage Insights. The underlying group is called D2NK. They did amazing things starting around 9-11. High grade communications, high secure information flow. They've worked in the oil and gas industry. They are a very interesting group. Deere's formed a JV with them. They have 90 some developers out in Denver putting things together. It's a very interesting group. In October, November, they acquired Precision Planting just down the road. And I should say, they acquired part of precision planting. They acquired the hardware piece while they left the software piece with Monsanto. They formed a partnership, just because there's two pieces. That is a huge step forward for the industry as far as how do I get this information flow and how do I manage this and how do I do this? So if you've got deer, if you're trying to figure this out, you're gonna have a lot of solutions fast. If you're not comfortable where that solution comes from, there's other options. But they, they're moving fast. 
The other thing they did the exact same week is they bought Monosim. Anybody know who Monosim is? Yeah. They, they are the precision planter for Europe. And if you go out to California in the Central Valley, the stuff that plants that little, you know, those real little, little, little seeds, it's a monosome planter. So don't know if you guys will ever have monosome planters or need them, but it's an amazing piece. Even, even though it's French, it's an amazing piece of technology. Just a joke. Just a joke. But they did that. And then they just announced two other things. They announced a prescription agreement with Agrian. Agrian is the biggest single platform within agriculture for ag retailers and for uh, food companies. And Sintera. Nobody knows Sintera, but you're going to know Sintera. If you have a UAV and you want to do something in the UAV, remember that name. Sintera is a small group out of Minneapolis group of three farmers out of North Dakota who over the last 30 years have had eight really successful software supply chain companies. They will take that imagery work and create a supply chain to you of exactly what you need. So that's, that's the deer kind of constellation of just how they've reached out to work with you. Here's the last kind of piece I want to leave with you. Food companies are going to reward optimizers. They're going to reward people who have that decision support information. It started with Unilever over in Europe. It's coming to the US. And all of these companies have standards in place by 2020. This is 2016, right? By 2020, they want to work with those people who have data. They want to work with those people who can share that information. Doesn't mean they won't work with you, but it's only if they can't get it from all the others that meet that kind of standard. The groups, the ABCD that kind of lays between you and those food companies, Archer Daniel Midland, Bungie, Cargill, Dreyfus, all are working to bring that sustainability piece of information along. So being able to provide information will be really key and really valuable to you. So if you're an optimizer and you're putting these pieces together, that's what's coming forward. So this is probably the original data scientist. Dimming brought together the uh, TQM. He's the one that helped the Japanese learn how to make Hondas and Toyotas that became the world standards. He's the father that drove then Six Sigma. You guys heard the term Six Sigma? Do you, anybody know what Six Sigma means? It means you can accurately repeat something to the sixth decimal point. Think those food companies might expect Six Sigma? Don't know, but maybe. But the other thing that's going to happen, my kids today, my baby's 20, my daughter then is 23, and my son is 26. They eat totally different than I do. I go into McDonald's and I read up there how many calories, you know, and then I think about how much salt. They look for things like fresh, clean, organic, and they're willing to pay more. As we start moving forward, I'm not exactly sure how that affects Illinois farmers, but it will. So this shifting of data and the people who can present it, not as an opinion, but as a fact, will have opportunities. So I talked about ownership and making sure you got a disaster plan. You, you may have seen Todd Jansen. Todd Jansen, I think, has spent more time looking at this for farm groups than anyone. But he basically, in this link, go, go read his full uh, talk and link. But if you own the field, you meet the data's yours. If you own the equipment that created the data, you own it. That means if the co-op sprays it, you may not. If the farmer generates the data, 
you may own it. And then that last, have a safe place if you own it. <laughs> it's like dollars, right? Don't lose it. Don't lose it. But that's, that's probably how I see how this whole ownership piece is going to shake out. In the court of law, Todd will go very quickly through that and say, we have no law, U.S. law, that really protects this. He will say, if you say, this is my trade secret for my farm, and you have people sign that, including your co-op, or including your ag retailer, or including John Deere, who's pulling information off your machine, then it might be protectable. Might, he says. Farm data doesn't fall under intellectual property, as the laws are written today. So again, as you think about who you're going to partner with to kind of solve all of this, or put all this together to create value, think about some of these items. Because it won't only increase your yield, but it'll definitely increase your profit over time. OK? So I just end with, uh, I appreciate being here. I appreciate the chance to share a little bit. The playbook that got you here is not going to be the playbook that you're going to play forward with. The ability to move forward is really the opportunity to focus on it. So I started with the first slide. The goal of education is not the accumulation of knowledge, but action. You've spent the day here getting lots of, and then lots of copious notes taken, right? When you leave here, make a list of what you're gonna do. There's a company called Alltech. The company was founded on $28,000. Dr. Pierce Lyons, who owns it now, it's worth $3 billion, and he totally owns the company. It's not a bad return on investment, is it? He leaves every meeting saying, what are you going to do within the next 24 hours with what you learned. What are you gonna to put to work? So I would just end with thank you very much and good luck with your action list for between today and tomorrow. Thank you very much.